The residential school system. Assimilation is the process by which an individual's or group's culture is absorbed into the dominant culture of a society. Cultural genocide is the deliberate destruction or killing of a group's culture. Both of these terms can be applied to the residential school system in Canada. Residential schools were government-sponsored religious boarding schools established to assimilate Indigenous children into European Canadian society. Within these schools, Indigenous peoples were stripped of basic human and legal rights, dignity, and integrity. The government viewed Indigenous peoples as savages and thought that the school would be a solution to the so-called Indian problem. Residential schools were federally run by the government under the Department of Indian Affairs, who collaborated with Christian missionaries to encourage religious conversion. The government funded the schools and paid the churches to operate them. 70% of the schools were run by the Roman Catholic Church, while the other 30% were run by the Anglican Church, United, and Presbyterian churches. In 1920, it became mandatory that every Indigenous child in Canada between the ages of 5 and 15 had to attend a residential school. An estimated 150,000 children attended residential schools. In total, over 130 residential schools operated in Canada between 1831 and 1996. In 1931, there were 80 residential schools operating in Canada. This was the most at any one time. In 1876, the Canadian government established the Indian Act, which gave them the ability to control almost every aspect of Indigenous peoples' lives. Sir John A. Macdonald, the first Prime Minister of Canada, thought that Indigenous people were in the way of developing Canada as a unified nation, and so he authorized the creation of residential schools. There were two primary objectives. One, to remove and isolate Indigenous children from their family, who served as their primary cultural influences. And two, to assimilate or absorb them into the dominant Canadian culture. These objectives were based on the idea that Indigenous cultural and spiritual beliefs were inferior to white European Canadian culture. Students were forcibly removed from their communities, homes, and parents, and forbidden to speak their Indigenous language or practice other traditions of their culture, like music, dance, religion, dress, and more. The schools were deliberately located far from the children's reservations, federal land set aside specifically for First Nations people to live on, so most students did not have any contact with their families while they were at school. In his speech to the House of Commons in 1883, Sir John A. Macdonald said this, When the school is on the reserve, the child lives with its parents, and though he may learn to read and write, his habits and training mode of thought are Indian. He is simply a savage who can read and write. It has been strongly impressed upon myself, as head of the department, that Indian children should be withdrawn as much as possible from the parental influence, and the only way to do that would be to put them in central training industrial schools where they will acquire the habits and modes of thought of white men. Students spent half of their day learning academic subjects and then the remainder of the day was devoted to manual work and religious instruction. The schools followed an industrial model, meaning that students were prepared for domestic service like cooking and sewing and manual labor like carpentry and farming. Teachings focused primarily on practical skills. The theory behind this was that students would learn skills that would allow them to earn a living as adults. However, the reality was that work had more to do with running the school inexpensively than with providing students with vocational training. Residential schools were underfunded and overcrowded. Boys and girls were kept separate and siblings were often not allowed to interact with one another. The schools had poor sanitation, heating and water facilities, and inadequate health care. The students were starved and neglected, and malnourishment made them particularly vulnerable to diseases like tuberculosis, influenza, smallpox, and pneumonia. They also suffered physical, emotional, and sexual abuse at the hands of their teachers and even other students. Students were given a new English name, they had their hair cut short, and they were dressed in uniforms, and their days followed a strict timetable.
They were also not allowed to speak their native language. Students were often beaten by school staff if they broke the rules. Punishments included no food or water for a whole day, being force-fed or fed spoiled food, exposure to freezing temperatures, withholding of medical attention, being whipped and beaten, public humiliation, and periods of isolation in a cell. Aaron Hansen of the University of British Columbia's Department of Anthropology has said the following. Survivors recall being beaten and strapped. Some students were shackled to their beds. Some had needles shoved in their tongues for speaking their native languages. Take a look at this photo of a student who attended a residential school in Canada. Thomas Markisik was a Cree boy from the Muscapautung Salto First Nation in Saskatchewan, who entered Regina Indian Industrial School in 1891. These propaganda photos were staged by the Department of Indian Affairs to demonstrate the civilizing mission of the residential school system. Kisik is wearing women's traditional attire that did not reflect what he would have worn at home. The residential school system has had a horrific and lasting impact on its students and their families and on Indigenous communities and culture as a whole. An estimated 6,000 children died while in the residential school system, and many bodies remain unaccounted for. As a result of the abuse, many of the survivors developed immeasurable long-term problems with mental illness, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and substance abuse later in life. Survivors had a hard time rejoining society, and many committed suicide. The schools also caused intergenerational trauma. They affected several generations in that the survivors were unable to communicate with their parents or share in their cultural and spiritual beliefs. And because the children did not grow up knowing what it was like to have a nurturing family life, they lacked the skills necessary to properly parent their own children. For survivors, abusive and violent behaviors, often combined with alcohol and drug abuse, are legacies of their time at the schools. Many survivors came to accept violence as a norm due to their personal trauma and passed this down to new generations. The 60s scoop refers to the large-scale removal or scooping of Indigenous children from their homes, communities, and families and their subsequent adoption by predominantly white, non-Indigenous middle-class families across Canada and the United States in the years after the residential schools closed. This experience left many of the adopted children with a lost sense of cultural identity and left many families and communities completely shattered as their children were stolen. While some adoptees were placed in homes with loving and supportive people, they could not provide culturally specific education and experiences essential to the creation of healthy Indigenous identities. Some adoptees also reported sexual, physical, and other abuse. These varied experiences and feelings led to long-term challenges with the health and livelihoods of the adoptees. With the support of the Assembly of First Nations and Inuit organizations, former residential school students took the federal government and the churches to court. Their cases led to the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, the largest class action settlement in Canadian history. The agreement sought to begin repairing the harm caused by residential schools. Aside from, from providing compensation to former students, the agreement called for the establishment of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, or TRC. In 2008, the TRC of Canada was created as a means to foster reconciliation the restoration of friendly relations between Canada's government and its Indigenous peoples. It was meant to guide Canadians through a discovery of what actually happened at the residential schools and to lay the foundation for healing and lasting reconciliation across Canada. In 2008, the government also issued an official apology and acknowledged that the residential school system was in fact a policy of cultural genocide aimed to kill the Indian in the child. As of September 2014, 29,384 applications for payments were paid and 23,892 were deemed ineligible. The average payment was $20,452. The average payment for victims of sexual abuse or serious physical abuse was about $114,179.
The TRC has collected more than 6,200 statements from former students, and most were recorded on video. It has also led a missing children and unmarked graves project in an attempt to document the number of deaths of children at the schools. Take a look at this timeline. In 1831, the Mohawk Institute is Canada's first residential school in Brantford and only admits boys up until 1834. In 1876, the Indian Act is established, which grants the government control over all aspects of Aboriginal life, including Indian status, land, and education. In 1879, the Davin Report recommends the creation of industrial schools that intentionally separate students from their parents to remove Indigenous influence. In 1884, amendments to the Indian Act authorized residential schools to be funded and operated by the government and churches, and traditional Indigenous ceremonies are banned. In 1896, 46 residential schools are in operation across Canada, all of which are overcrowded and rampant with disease. In 1920, attendance at residential schools is made mandatory for every Indian child between 5 and 15 years of age. Between 1960 and 1980, thousands of Indigenous children are taken from their families and placed into foster care during the 60s scoop as residential schools begin to close. In 1996, the last federally run facility, the Gordon Indian Residential School in Saskatchewan, is closed. In 2008, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada is launched to inform Canadians about the atrocities committed at residential schools, and Prime Minister Stephen Harper issues a federal apology. From 2007 to 2012, over 150,000 residential schools students' tragic stories are documented, and survivors receive a common experience payment. Consider this statistic. For students who attended residential schools, the odds of dying in their lifetime were 1 in 25. The odds of Canadians who served during World War II, 1 in 26. The goal was to resolve the so-called Indian problem. So, in 1883, the Canadian government officially instituted the residential school system. By the 1930s, nearly 75% of Indigenous children between the ages of 7 and 15 were forced to attend these schools. Unable to return home for months or even years, Indigenous children were often neglected and abused, stripped of their language and culture. Thousands of children died while at residential school. Others went missing, never to be seen again. At least 150,000 First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children were institutionalized over the course of more than 100 years. There are approximately 80,000 living survivors. Some have become leaders in their communities, teachers, counselors, commissioners. For many, the trauma of the mental, physical, and sexual abuse they suffered hasn't faded. The children and grandchildren of survivors have inherited those wounds. They have persisted, manifesting as depression, anxiety, family violence, suicidal thoughts, substance use. This is called intergenerational trauma, and it can take generations to heal. For Indigenous peoples, that healing can involve a return to the culture that was taken from them. For others, it involves formal acknowledgement of their experiences. There is no place in Canada for the attitudes that inspired the Indian residential school system to ever prevail again. For Canada, it means confronting the past and working towards reconciliation. Laws and apologies are necessary to help us move forward, but reconciliation also requires true understanding and empathy to create space where healing is possible.